Hello, Jesse Ward, and today we're going to talk about errors, exceptions, explosions, death, <laughs> anything bad that happens in your program that's called exceptional is an error, and it has to be handled, or it's unhandled, one of the two. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to cover all about errors, all about exceptions, all about logging those exceptions, how do you catch them, how do you handle them, what is try catch, what is finally, why and when would, would you use this stuff, global exception handling, and some minor things about how you can debug it and deal with uh, using the tools to actually do it beyond just a logging scenario. And as you can see, I, I did, wore my favorite shirt from like, I think right before I got in this industry, 13 years ago, it's full of holes, which is a metaphor for all the pain and suffering, some real, some imagined, from all the errors that have occurred from a variety of programming languages over the years, right? It's indicative of that. So what are exceptions? Exceptions and errors are basically things that happen in exceptional situations in your program. That's a misnomer. It's incorrect. Anybody who's been in this industry for a long time knows that they are not exceptional. They are common. They are not amazing. Sometimes they're mundane. They happen for the stupidest reasons. Sometimes we're tired, we're distracted, we're under deadlines, we have no requirements, we're pivoting because we're a startup. Whatever it is, it's they're common. They happen all the time. Sometimes you want them to happen, right? They're indicative of a situation you expected to happen. You're writing unit test suites, whatever, right? So they're bad things and they, you know they're gonna happen. You're gonna test for them. If they happen and you didn't expect them, there are ways of getting around it. And most importantly, there are two solutions to really handling errors that you know are going to occur. And that is either mitigation through try catch or global exception handling. And number three is through effective logging. Okay, so we're only going to do the basics of those today. So, what is an error again? I've shown you some by accident in the past. Here's the most common one. All right, we're going to say the most common one is when you have a variable that you haven't even declared, like you haven't used a bar anywhere. And you just try to access it. Hey, what's up, uh, person that uh, first name? Uh, what's that guy's name? You run it, and your browser's like, hey, uh, dude, uh, red, undefined, uncaught reference error, person not defined. So there are three parts to this string I want you to look at, okay? Number one is uncaught. That means no one caught it. It means it was unexpected. And if it, even if it was unexpected, no one attempted to make an effort to catch it or handle it, or be aware of its existence and have an out. Errors and exceptions usually will stop your program from running most of most of the time. Sometimes your program can have it occur in a small little place and it'll explode and it won't hurt the existing spaceship, right? Other times it'll blow the whole thing up. The kingdom come, stop the universe. So that's what uncaught means. Number two, the type of error. It's a reference error. It means you reference something that can't be referenced. You can't go, hey, nothing, what's your first name? Now, obviously, if you're in a silly mood, nothing's first name would be, well, nothing. That's my first name. But it's not a silly mood. It's a computer. It doesn't have moods. There is no first name of nothing. Undefined, null, they're all the same thing as nothing. So the computer program is like, this is impossible. Show red. Right? That's what computers do. So that's a reference error. Number, number three is some English. So I'm a programmer, but I'm human. Can you please give me some more details about what happened? Well, that's the third part. Person is not defined. What they're saying is the person variable doesn't exist. I didn't actually define it via a var. It's not some magical global. I looked on window, it's not there. So programmer, sorry to break it to you, but this variable doesn't exist. So you can do whatever you want with it, math, subtraction, access properties via dot first name. I don't care, I'm just letting you know, doesn't exist. So before we even get to this, hey, let's play with this variable, I just wanna let you know what you're playing with doesn't exist, right? That's bad, it's impossible for the computer con to continue from this line of code. So it shows red and says, here's the error is, figure it out, right? So that's what those three parts are. The uncaught means no one handled it. The reference error is the type. And the third part is the description. Now you'll notice there's a couple other neat little things here that Chrome and Safari will show you. Firefox is getting there. Go team Mozilla. You'll notice it has a red X. So the point of this red text and this red X is to inspire dread, blood, uh, fear, Oh my gosh, something bad happened, right? That's what it's there for because usually red and red X's are accurate in programming. It's bad, it's bad news bears, right? Additionally, there's a neat little thing down here. Let me shrink this up a bit. It's a little too big. Go to sources, yeah, it's good. You'll see this little red X down here. That is how many errors occurred 
in the current time the program has been running when you started it. That could start with zero, it could accumulate bunches over time, it, they could have 50 immediately, right? This is just a running tally of how many errors your program has, right? So that's what that is. So the last two things I wanna show you is if you drop it down or to give you the call stack or what functions brought me to this point? What set of operations or code, you know, functions calling functions, brought me to this particular error? Well, in this case, it was an anonymous function. Usually that means you ran code on root. So if you're not, you know, doing hard code things with classes or modules or whatever else, that means loop. The other problem with anonymous function is it could be an anonymous function, like a function that doesn't have a name. So remember, if we write a function like this, which is a declared function, we'll go, yo, home slash. That's his name. Okay, and then we're gonna blow up good. Boom. Just kidding. Let's just access the magical variable of A, which doesn't exist. Yo, home slice. And then we rerun it, you can see, all right, A is not defined, but it was caused by an anonymous function, which then called your home slice, right? So that is the last point of origin to where this error occurred within this region of space, Captain. Lastly, we have where it occurred, okay? This is usually, in smaller programs, accurate. In larger programs, it goes down. If you're using like a transpile language, like CoffeeScript or whatever else, they're getting a little better at making this, but sometimes this is completely inaccurate or it's worthless. So if you ever seen minified code where they take your JavaScript and they shrink it up, get rid of all the white space, shrink the variable names, put a one line, this thing right here, that ain't gonna help you. Unless you're like Uber computer MIT student who's like, that clearly states the code right there and that like 1000 line that I scrolled to, I know what the error is, I don't know what your problem is. If you're that person, you ain't watching this video, okay? So that's what that goes. And the cool thing about it is it's a hyperlink. So when you click it, it'll take you right to the where error is. It'll even give you a little bit of white space and say, look, the error occurred right here. And this is a type. Sometimes the message that it gives you is you know, helpful, other times not. So that is generally what an error is, how it ex you know, explodes in your browser, how your browser can show you where it happened, where, you know, what function stack led you to this point, what file was responsible for it, and where in that file it occurred, okay? And the cool thing is sometimes they'll even give you the stack trace of the what started this whole mess, because sometimes certain functions will lead to an error. What's different about an error than any other piece of code? Well, number one, these errors would typically break things. So watch this. We're gonna create a function of steps that do things, okay? So we're gonna say console log step one, and just to make it consistent, we'll do dose, you know. Copy pasta coding. If you're not aware of copy pasta coding, it's when you copy paste rather than type. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's lazy. Indicative of a problem. But I ain't that strict. All right. So we're gonna have step one explode. So we're gonna say throw abort. My mere existence destroys any potential operations henceforth. That means anything that happens after me ain't gonna happen. That's what that means. So let's call them in order. Step one, step two, step three. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we're gonna call all three. We're gonna go to our console. Oh, look, dose and trace didn't console out. Why that? Well, our whole program aborted once it got to this nastiness right here. So cool, sometimes you want that to happen. Sometimes if you're building a very important business application, if it's modifying data on the client for whatever reason, you don't, you know, you don't want that to happen. Other times you don't want this to happen, right? This is bad, but sometimes you can't control this. What do you mean you can't control this, Jesse? Well, let's show you, watch this. So let's take out the throw and make one that we can control. So we didn't we didn't define A, okay? And we can't go inside of console log to prevent that. Oh, our whole program didn't even run, right? We didn't even get the, the consoles because A is not defined. So that particular one, it blew up in step one and didn't make it any further. So if you wanna see it in action, we can set a breakpoint, refresh, step through it, and it goes to step one, okay, cool. Our function stack is anonymous, goes to step one. Got it, okay. I can click to see the program in action. Understood. Let's go to the next line of code and it explodes and stops the whole program, right? So that's why errors are bad, is that they stop the entire program 
Sometimes. So, I mean, it's got to be interesting, right? It wouldn't be fun if it was, like, consistent. Why would you do that? I mean, it's not... Anyway, so... I'm trying to be nice today. I'm trying to be nice today. So, yeah. It, it, it would be helpful if it was consistent. So, that one we can't control, okay? So, that is an intentional thrown error. And you can throw just about any other data type that you want. You could even throw an array. <laughs> Boom. Chaka. Laka, um, chaka, laka, chaka, laka. Right? You could send whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just like console. JavaScript will do its best to show that error with a two string to the console, right? At the end of the day, the result is the same. It's an error in your application. It's unhandled. It was unexpected. It's exceptional. And we're going to probably stop your program here. Not good, right? Not good at all. So, how do we mitigate this? How do we stop our program from blowing up well there's two things you can do obviously you can fix the problem but sometimes those problems are out of your control you cannot control the internet going down you are a web-based application most applications written in javascript are running in the web browser and if the user is at a you know bad starbucks or their company's internet goes down they're using your site it's not your fault so if you say i'd like to log in but i'm not getting a response back that's not your fault so you need to expect these errors to occur okay so assuming you can expect them, how do you handle them? You catch them, right? This is where we call caught errors and uncaught errors, okay? So let's catch an error. You do that using try catch, which follows the exact same format for the most part of if then. The difference is catch gets the error. So whatever error occurred, doesn't matter where it occurred, as long as it happened within this block of code area right here, you're going to catch it. It's going to be in catch. It's going to give you one and only parameter in there, and that's going to be error. Okay? So let's try to do some nasty stuff. Console log. Nasty. Nasty don't exist. He's on the fire. It's going to cause explosions. All right, that's nasty. Then we're going to log it out. Error. I'm using comma to denote so I can see exactly what that error is. Okay? So when we run... It's not red. Why is it not red? Because we caught it. Now we can choose not to do this, right? No error, error goes away. Now I'm gonna tell you why that's bad in a minute. So we have an error, we've logged it, we've caught it. It's a reference error, cool. But it doesn't have a nifty information anymore. Well, that's kind of sad. All right, well, let's take this out and treat it as a normal native thing, okay? Still, it's just a nasty object. What if we try to string? There we go. It prints it nice. We can see what it is. So that particular error object, right? An error object says nasty is not defined. Cool. Okay, cool. So we now can try code in a safe environment. And if it happens, we can catch it. Now, what is the result of that again? Watch this. So as I was saying, step three. Your code can continue to run, right? And that's the wonderful thing about try catch is that you can try scary, nasty code that you have a high likelihood of breaking and you can catch those errors. You can continue to log those errors, right? So people know that an error actually occurred, but the existing program is not negatively affected. Hallelujah. So that is how you catch errors, okay? So I showed you a bad practice. I want to show you again. That, when you comment out or leave the error error blank, that's called swallowing exceptions, and that is horribly bad for a variety of reasons. The main reason is, is if something breaks in your application, nobody knows, right? There is no current way in the console to see that an error occurred. Now, a console next to sources and using debugger is your first line of defense. Now, keep in mind, as you get more experienced and you're actually responsible for this, you can actually delegate the responsibility of seeing if something broke to your users, to your managers, project managers, and QA. They'll use the console to identify as a built-in debugger to any application that you write a place to look for errors, to look for problems. If something goes wrong, they'll know, they'll, after time, they'll learn to look there first. So if you provide errors that actually are in English versus undefined all pointer or console.error, I didn't seem to have a nasty variable. Instead of 
getting an email like it broke, I don't know what goes on, bleh, which all programmers hate. Engineers by trade like to get problems that are known what they are. Like I know what the problem is, here's what it is, can you please fix it? Because engineers like fixing and building things. They don't like diagnosing things. That's what doctors do, right? That's their thing. They make guesses about their expertise and do the best they can, right? Under horrible, horrible situations of legal threats, right? Engineers, for the most part, don't have to worry about that, but it still is frustrating. Well, here, I didn't seem to get a nasty variable. A QA person or PM can email you that log. You can put it in your code and find out pretty quickly what it is, right? This goes back to don't make me think, okay? So I'm gonna illustrate that point more in a bit. But you notice I use a console error. So it looks like an error, right? Acts like an error, has the whole anonymous function, the thing, it adds the you know index, it points to the line number it occurred and, as well as the file, right? And I can hover over it and actually see the file path, the actual path of the file to make sure I know exactly what file it was. When I click on it, I can see in line of where it occurred and so can management, assume your code is not minified and compressed, right? And that's cool, but it doesn't affect the other program. You can see the other two lines of code ran just fine. And that's what's great about try catch is that you can catch it and then log something more in English. So let's get a little bit more effective here. Let's build a parsing program and show you how you can effectively handle those app, those errors like so. So we're gonna build something that parses persons from strings. So if you remember our gladiator game, we're gonna take a magic string that looks like this and make people out of it. Get person, junk. So let's assume at this point that you're gonna make a call to the server and they're gonna give you a string back and it's your responsibility to parse that into people's names, okay? So objects on the client. So we're gonna take that chunk. We're gonna use an awesome string parameter called split, which takes a bunch of words. So let's say you have a paragraph of words. Each one of those words is separated by a single space. You can say, hey, take all the spaces out of that string, put each word in, own, in an array in order that I got them and strip all the spaces out. That's what split does, a pretty rad little function. We know that if that's the case, then the first name is going to be the first item in that array. And the last name is going to be the second item in that array. Then we can return that person. So whoever wants to create the person, console.log, can see it, get person, Yes, it won. That's me. So we can see our object, we're parsing, creating people from magic strings, fantastic. Now, what happens if we don't send a string? We get an error, it's uncaught, okay? Let's be a little bit more careful. We're gonna log it out as an error but it won't negatively affect anybody else who wants to attempt to parse things. So we're gonna say, failed to parse a person from a string. And then to be nice, we're gonna pass the error just alongside in case people want more detail about it. Okay. Now you can see we got a type error. Type error means we got a null pointer. Somebody's trying to access something that's null. In this case, chunk is null, right? Chunk is not not working, whatever else, okay? So, there are two ways to prevent such errors, such exceptions, that if you can help it. We're gonna talk about low-hanging fruit here, okay? There's a variety of things you can do, but the two most low-hanging fruit, that means least amount of work for the greatest amount of game, is no pointer checks that you manually do yourself, and you only do them on areas where you're parsing data that was not made by you. You being the guy or a girl writing on the client, not the server people. They're the ones who get you in trouble because they pull out things in the database and they go rah, and they throw it to the client and it's your fault when it breaks. I've been doing this long enough to know how to take that blame and go whoosh. But I act as a nice developer and I work with them to help solve the problem as a go team. But in my head, I'm like, why do I always get blamed for this? Right? Because they see your code. They don't see the Ruby guys. The Ruby guys are all cool in San Francisco behind the scenes, whereas JavaScript guys are up front. You know what I'm saying? It's a rough laugh. The cool thing is we can work for five minutes and people like to see our changes. With the Ruby guys work for months, it's like, what did you do today? I didn't really see any visible changes. Unless they're rendering all this stuff on the client side, in which case, you know, whatever. So one proactive thing you can do is if you check for null, sorry, too much Lua. 
Not null. The JavaScript way, not the Lua way. We can say throw chunk is null. I cannot parse a string that doesn't exist. It's an impossibility, right? So when you run it this time, let's actually take out this string. Let's we'll print the error out in general. When we run it, we actually get something a little more helpful. Okay, chunk is null, doesn't exist. However, when we click it, we don't really know that chunk is null. Where's chunk, right? So let's take this out. We don't need the try catch. When we run it, you say the chunk is null. Okay, we click it. It'll say, all right, chunk is null. It'll actually take we, us to the context of where the problem occurred with the information. So again, go back to the video yesterday. Don't make me think. You can actually intentionally throw errors that help you identify what those errors are, okay? With a little bit more information. So instead of null pointer type, reference not error, and you have to work your way back, right? Through deductive reasoning to go back to what the real cause was, very Sherlock Holmes style. Instead, you can just get right to the point and say, look, chunk is null, I can't parse a string that's null. So you immediately know whoever called get person didn't give me a valid string. So you could even reward it to say that. Whoever called get person didn't give me a valid string. So when you run it and it says it failed, you can see, not whoever, ha, whoever, not however. Let's try that again, English. Whoever called get person gave me a valid string. Immediately you know what the problem is. Like that's helpful. Now it seems benign on one function, but when this function turns into hundreds of thousands of lines of code, which you might be doing if you get into software development or enterprise development, this is a very common theme that happens. So is that a good use of throw? No. Jesse Warden recommends professionally that you never intentionally utilize throw. What? What? There's a couple of reasons for that, and I'll explain why in future videos how you can get around it. But for the most part, I would encourage you to do something like this. Something, not exactly this, but something like this, okay? Using console can be very dangerous. So you have an error, but it doesn't negatively affect the rest of the application. You notice that my get person at least attempt to log the response, which is undefined. If you don't explicitly return anything, it defaults to returning undefined, right? So at least the program will still go, but it looks like an error. People can debug it. They can look at it and see what actually happened. But the rest of the program can go on its merry way, right? And you're not, again, swallowing errors. You're trying to be helpful, explain what happened, give some context around the error, and explain what it is. But you're not actually being part of the problem. You're being part of the solution. And that is debugging and fixing the error, right? So even with a null check uh, in there and actually parsing it, you've at least started to get on the path of writing, you know, code It's a little more resilient. And if it does break, it's a little more helpful in solving the problem around itself rather than being part of, you know, the problem of I just code, I just, I just do one thing and I do it right. Okay. That becomes a problem after a while. The other thing too, is you notice there's no more try catch, right? Try catches after a while can mount up pretty big. You don't want to wrap everything in the try catch. Your code can get very verbose very quickly. Additionally with a try catch, um, they do have a minor performance impact because the code is running in a safe environment, right? So that's another problem. Okay. And that way, if you write it like that, you can still bubble up the error. Now, there's one other part of try catch that I didn't show you, and that's called finally. And that is, regardless of what happens above, I should run anyway. So sometimes if you want to attempt to log in, cool, log into the server. If it fails for whatever reason, cool, show an error to the message in the user dialog box. I'm sorry, can't log in today. Regardless of one of those two things happened, I should definitely you know, go to another screen or something. Well, here's the problem with finally in JavaScript and in, in a lot of languages that aren't Java. Who cares? Like if you caught the error, that's the same bloody thing for the most part. The difference is, is that finally will run regardless of one of these, you know, happens. But in most cases, if you don't have an explosion here, so will this, right? If you have an explosion here, you're actually writing code that explodes inside the catch. That is really bad. Nesting try catches within try catch error blocks, even worse, right? It's like you shouldn't do that kind of stuff. So assuming you've handled the error and you've recovered as best you could, in most cases, 99% of the time, all you can do is log it and say, I'll fix it later. This is really all you can do, right? So that's why most people don't use finally. 
the theory was is that it was readable and that you could guarantee something would run in a certain block. It has uh, more connotations than languages that run this block of code in a certain security context. JavaScript, not so much. None of that matters. So do it, log the error and do nothing else in the cache, <laughs> right, to be safe, and then continue on your merry way, okay? So we understand what errors are. We understand how we can create them. We understand why we shouldn't create them. We understand the concept of using try-catch, how you can attempt to mitigate try-catch and help to, instead of throw your own errors, you can make them look like errors via console error and give the developer you or someone else on your team or you from six months and from now when you've forgotten this code, a chance, fighting chance to actually debug this, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We've also shown you why finally is dumb and most people don't use it. It's de facto standard way. Just to drive the point home, let's just do one more stack unwinding so you can see how devastating this can be in a extremely large program, okay? This is really quick. It's just a, a recap of something we've already shown. But I think it's important to give you a better understanding of how that errors can be devastating to a program and how effective that console.error can really be in helping at least ensure you can get something done today. <laughs> It's always helpful to get something done. So we'll say throw, boom. Cause an error right here. This will call step one. And this will call step two. So we have this big block of functions. Step three is gonna instantiate it all, okay? So we're gonna go to net sources here. We're gonna put this uh, block here. We're gonna debug line step 33. I just hit, all I did was go to sources when I run my program and I, I clicked there to put a breakpoint. You can toggle it off if you put it in the wrong spot. It's okay. Just put it there. So refresh while it's there. It'll start there. I'm going to hit this next step. It's going to go to line by line by line. Okay. Run step three, runs the log, goes to step two. Step two runs, runs the step log and runs the step two. So you can see their stack is getting bigger and bigger. It's constantly adding more functions as we have functions to call functions. Right. And then it goes boom. And the whole thing gets destroyed and unwound. Like the stack just goes goodbye. So you can imagine as your program gets really large, like the one we wrote, you know, a couple days ago, that's, it, it's bad, right? So watch what happens here. All right, same thing. But it continues on its merry way and runs any other code that could have been ran at that time, right? And unwinds the stack slowly. You can see it slowly counting down. Cool, and everything runs and we're happy and blah, 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 and that could be an error. But at least for the most part, we guarantee that we don't negatively affect things and we don't affect other functions that could be completely unrelated. And that's the key here. The reason I showed you this is sometimes, like I said, these errors are wrong. They're not always correct and they're different per browser and they're different per browser based on if caching ena is enabled the first time or not. And they're different on devices that utilize these browsers. So for example, I have a blog post, let me find for you, that shows just an example of how different these errors can possibly be, which is quite frustrating to be honest. When you're trying to effectively, you know, do the mapping that I taught you in your head, a type error means that I access a property that doesn't exist. A reference error really means I forgot to put a var in front of the variable. Okay, I got it. I'm gonna map it like Nicholas Cage and put it there. Okay, cool. You have a fighting chance, right? Wrong, wrong. So you can see, here's what I got in Firefox. I got an empty screen. No exception, no nothing. That was with Firebug. That was, was the latest build. That was with Firebug disabled. I tried both. Chrome, I got an empty screen. Like no exception, no anything. In Chrome, the second time, I got an uncaught syntax error. That means the code was misformatted. We'll get to syntax errors. So I got some magically unexpected token. That was after caching. <laughs> what? That was with caching already there? I got Safari the first time I ran. I got with statements aren't allowed in strict mode. And then I got a syntax error the second time. What is going on? Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? So again, the reason it's important to add errors that you know is that when an error occurs, sometimes the errors you get are wrong. Sometimes the places they say where the code is blown up is incorrect. And I'm not talking about non-minified you know, un code here or non-unglified JS. Sometimes they're just wrong. The errors that they think are where occurring are completely off base. Now, maybe this is getting better with you know new releases of Chrome and WebKit, but I've already lost weak so I can tell you you just doesn't matter 
any language that you're using, those console errors will help save you and help save you lots of time when you're trying to debug. And not just you, but others, right? And if something occurs, you're not even there at the desk, it's somebody else is using your application, they'll see it and go, oh, I've seen that error before, that's probably because the server's down, cool. I don't even need to involve you. You never even hear about it, right? So that's why console error is a lot more effective than throw and try catch. So let's talk about the errors that you can't catch, okay? And this is indicative of any interpreted language, okay? It's unique to interpreted languages. Syntax errors are based on JavaScript being written wrong. So you write the JavaScript, you think you're doing a good job, and you know, you're talking in the video because you get a big mouth and you think you know a lot about programming, you wanna teach others because you think you're really trying to help the planet, but in reality, you're just fool yourself and your name is not Jesse Warden, right? So that's that's usually about, you're going about your day. Yeah, you're gonna console.log this guy. Cool, so I gotta log this guy. But what if you accidentally forget the comma? Watch this. A syntax error, okay? We get an uncaught syntax error. So this is before your code's even run, but JavaScript is run, right? We're building something called an expression here. An expression is basically a mathematical operation. One plus one equals two. That chunk of code is run. In this case, our object being defined is actually kind of being run. It's actually creating the object, setting some properties to Jesse, defining a function, setting its scope to person, right? But because we forgot this comma, it starts to run the code and goes, Bleh, right, and freaks out, right? It shows a syntax error. I don't know what this identifier was, blah. And the same thing with, if you add the comma, but you add a semicolon in the anonymous function in the object, which is different than doing an anonymous function like this, where you're more than welcome to add a semicolon, right? It'll say unexpected token of semicolon. I don't understand. What what is it doing there? Sorry. Now here's the problem with syntax errors. Let's put that back so we can still make the semicolon blow up. Okay, cool. So we'll define all variables in a setup function and just put a try catch around it, right? And then say error, dude, our variable setup didn't work. We need to fix it. Alright, right here. We gotta fix it. What? Didn't catch a syntax error because the syntax verifier or the actual part of JavaScript that looks at the file to make sure it's well formed before it attempts to run it is a completely separate operation. So it can't really be caught even though it's technically being run on that line. So for example, if we go to sources and we say, all right, let's start at line eight, refresh the program and go line by line, okay? Well, we can't. What if we set it on 10 and then we try that? Well, we can't really do that either because it didn't even run. <laughs> really frustrating. So some errors you can't catch, specifically syntax errors. This is why you constantly want to rerun your code a lot. And again, this goes back to the map. Map syntax errors to something you mistyped or map syntax errors to something the server guys mistyped. This thing in JSON that was invalid or XML that was invalid or the HTML that you're dealing with is invalid, right? It's just a, one of these things you'll learn. It's, 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 it's not something that you're gonna go, oh, I'm, I gotta be smart to know these things. No, you don't. You just experience them, you learn the hard way and you memorize it, right? It happens after about fifth time you get bit, you'll remember, okay? So is there a way to capture like all variable, like do I really honestly have to do console errors and if checks for parsing code and put try catches everywhere else? No, if you're that lazy or efficient, you can do window on error. This is a very well supported error function that's called for you when any uncaught exception occurs, okay? So uncaught means nobody wanted to try to catch for it. It's a null pointer from a piece of code I haven't even written, another developer did, it's not my fault. Like I use try catches everywhere, he didn't. I use null checks everywhere, he didn't. I use good console errors to help me find those errors, he didn't. Don't worry, we know on error will find it. As long as it's when you're in your domain. If we get into iframes, it's completely different, okay? So Windows error has the following syntax, the error message or error type, right? Let's put error message, error message. It has the file name that it occurred in and the line number. Almost exactly the same thing as the syntax error, okay? So we can print that out. Now I'm gonna use a specific format I like to do. Lines, so if you get 50 billion errors, you can clearly see them as they're stacked on top of each other by this nice little visual line, okay? 
and then we're just gonna use a log. So we're gonna have to, we don't want too much red. If we have lots of red, people get scared by lots of red, especially traders. So that's day traders. So let's do error message. Copy pasta coding. File name, file name, line number, line number. 45, 45, sold. My wife's been watching um, Storage Wars. What a silly, silly show. There's parts of it I like, but man, these guys are silly. That one girl who's like, I have a feeling about this thing. What? How do you have a feeling about a storage unit? Like, it must have been because they were in Vegas and they were paid to say, I don't know. This is a silly show, man. All right, so, window error, uncaught. So let's cause an error that's more benign than that. So let's say console.log A. Our famous logging of a variable that doesn't exist. You'll notice that our window.error function will run, right? Pretty cool. It's going to run through everything, okay? And it'll show you the two errors that they occur at. Our console error, right? But specifically right here, A is not defined. It shows you where that particular error occurred. If you go to the console, we can see it printed out, right? Pretty cool. So it's going to catch those uncaught errors. Now watch this. By the way, Windows error, uncaught reference errors, that's not defined. So it's automatically going to do two string for you, which is kind of cool. The file name that occurred at, which you can click on, right? As well as the line number at which it occurred. Okay, so cool. You can do your own custom logger that way. That's great, but it's global. So if you don't have it handled, it'll catch it. So places you haven't found yet, it'll grab them. Well, what if we do catch this one? Catch error. Console.error. Dude, A is not defined. Please use a var A. Thanks. Uh-oh. The A team flying above me. All right, let's get rid of these silly breakpoints. Hit play. Get rid of the silly breakpoint. Hit play. Hit console. Dude, var A is not defined. Please use var A things. Notice that our window never ran. Now, if you want to see it again, we'll put a breakpoint in there. Notice it never reaches the breakpoint because it only gets uncaught errors, right? Which is great. You can define this once, and then any of your code afterwards is more than welcome to get try catch. If you miss, don't worry. Window.error has your back. Now there's one thing that has some subtle behavior about window.error that I want to show you. So let's comment out our try catch block and just grab the bad boy. What you gonna do when they come for you? When you return true, which as you can see is basically uh, not the default behavior, okay? Default is return undefined or anything but true, really. If you return true, the error is not actually reported in the normal fashion. The only person who's going to be aware of it, and from a logging perspective and from a showcase perspective, is this function. That's it. This log's still not going to run sup, right? We're not going to see sup ever work because this failed, but we at least know, hey, it happened here. So we can choose or not choose to show errors to users or let other errors occur, okay? You don't have to put a blank. You can put an if then or whatever else. If you return true, it basically says to the browser, look, I've got it handled. There's no need to print these exceptions to the window. There's no need to you know, do anything like that. I've got it handled. If you return false, it'll continue printing them out to the screen and allow them to affect. You can see where they occurred, yada, yada, okay? So that's the subtle behavior of returning true. You should never launch production going like this. In production, you want it to be false because unfortunately you want those errors to occur, see them and fix them as quickly as possible. The only time you do this is if you're doing a demo for a client or you're building a prototype for investors or you're a design agency and you're trying to launch for a client who's about to sign on the dotted line. That's when you do this. Otherwise, real men use return false, okay? And if you're a woman, you got skills. Mm, return false, baby girl. All right, that's what you do. So. That is window.error. He's got your back twice on Sundays. So that is error handling, ladies and gentlemen. That is errors exceptions. Again, errors are things that go wrong in your program. They usually stop all code executing from that point forward. They don't run anything else. You can choose to throw your own errors, whatever data type you want. You can also throw your own error object, right? You can say new error and my custom error. But keep in mind, anything after this is usually ignored. So my file name. And line 20,000, right? That's also ignored as well. So when I run it, my custom error, but it's really an index image on line eight.
right? And it tells you where it is. So you can do that as well if you want. Most people just throw strings. Again, I suggest you don't throw strings. I suggest you use a logger, like log for JavaScript or something else, and then do a console.error or log.error. So users can see it, but it doesn't negatively affect the rest of the application. It looks and acts like an error, so you can at least treat it and use the existing tools that Chrome and Safari and Firefox provide in helping you to debug it. The error message has some context of where the error occurred, why it occurred, and usually maybe a, a suggestion on how to remedy and fix the error, right? So those three things are what I personally recommend. In other cases, try catches are good. You should definitely use them to mitigate the other problems. For those errors that you don't know about, there's one last thing I wanna show you. And that is Chrome and Safari have some great ways of fixing things. So I'm gonna say, hello. Then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna do a dangerous log, dangerous. log this out a is not defined bro bro do you even debug then we're going to say console.log moo so we've got to try catch around this so hello and a will run but this is an uncaught reference error so you'll notice in the sources, on the very bottom there's this little stop sign looking thing with a pause button in the middle what that means is by default the debugger here is not going to stop unless you've manually put a breakpoint. But it has a little trick that it can stop on, and if you hover over, you'll see, on all exceptions. So anytime anything blows up, I want the debugger to go so I can quickly find where that error is. We have an error right here. And you can tell it's stopped because over here in the call stack, it goes, hey, hey, dude, I'm paused on an exception reference error. And if you can keep going if you want, you can say, okay, let's, can we step behind it? Yes, we can, because we're in a try catch block. Try catch blocks allow us to handle the exceptional errors exceptionally well to not negatively affect others. However, you can see, again, we're stopped on console log moo, right? And we don't know that because we're not <laughs> we're not in a try catch. So this is like, well, I'm stopping here, but I don't know why I'm stopping here. There we go. Now we're paused on this particular error after it evaluated it and attempted to run, set a breakpoint for us, and we can see it happen, right? So you can actually have the debugger, but why is that important? Watch this. You click it again, it's only gonna stop on uncaught. So we've caught this error. There's no need to debug it. We know why it occurs. We might not be able to really fix it right now. It could be on the server side, guys. It might not be our fault. It might be the library is an old version. The other people are fixing it, whatever. Bottom line is you know about the error and you've handled it the best you can, whether that's logging or whether that's tried some run some other code or whatever that is. But some code that you're still coding or somebody else did, you might not know. Is there exceptions I haven't caught yet? Well, if you keep this guy purple, it'll only stop on those. Now notice it aborted our try catch. It already knew about that one because it's try catch, it's handled, right? But it stopped on our log for moo, right? So that's a great way and a great tool to help you find additional proactively errors quickly that you haven't yet caught, okay? So again, that's errors, that's exceptions. That's how you handle them. That's uh, how you use the tools to do it. And again, a lot of your day is gonna be, you know, try catch, or you know, finding these null pointers, fixing these null pointers. Sometimes you want to use try catch, other times you just want to do a null check. Null checks are wonderful. Just check to see if it's null before you do all this stuff on it, rather than it's never gonna be null, why would it be null? Guarantee it, 90% of, of the time if it comes from someone other than you, like the back end, that's saying gonna be null, like sometime in his life. So you should plan for that. If you do a null pointer, fantastic. You actually can check to see if it's null and then log it out versus, well, let's just, you know, wait for the throws to come and we'll catch them, right? That's bad news bears, okay? So I hope this was helpful and I hope you understand how errors can be mitigated against.